Whether you're ordering wings for the game, whipping up a seven layer dip, or ordering pizza, there's something about football that makes you want to eat. And this football season, Uber Eats has the best deals on game day food, no matter what you're craving. From two for one pizza to buy one, get one wings, Uber Eats will be dropping new deals each week, all season long. Uber Eats, official on demand delivery partner of the NFL. Order now. Terms and conditions apply. See app for details. Money decisions don't have to be either or. With Bank of America, they can be yes and. Like yes to sunny vacations and rainy day funds. Can our digital tools and guidance help you create the future you want? Yes. And help you keep enjoying today too. Do more with the bank that asks. What would you like the power to do? Explore our tips and more at bankofamerica.com slash yes and. say back with because it's been a while a episode of the blue turf season 2024 slash 25 is that right this is that bell from the casey soccer journal with me i have eric bergrud who does so many things and i so appreciate how you doing today eric i'm doing great it's fantastic to be back at the world famous kansas city soccer dome they have a brand new casey heard outside so if you needed a reason to come here now you have an extra one i stopped and take a uh, took a picture of it uh, a couple weeks ago I, I came and watched kick arounds not official trainings kick arounds took a couple pictures of it people like oh i love it um i know it used to be somewhere up in the northland but now it's here now it's here and uh training camp started so it's a good time to re, re uh, tool ourselves retool yep. this podcast get ready for another season we have we have uh, a little bit of breaking news we'll get to here in a minute we are at the the world famous kc soccer dome there's nobody out on the field right now well somebody just walked out as i said that but the players are back in the back somewhere probably doing paperwork or something but it's the first official day of training camp they've had kick rounds before this but Training camp has officially started today. And I think Comets fans have been waiting and waiting and waiting. You know when November's here, the season is near. And uh, sure enough, St. Louis ambush come calling uh, home and home series here at the end of the month. Yeah, because we're just I mean, four weeks away. or Three, three weeks away plus, three yeah. and a half, yeah. I know. Actually, I ran into uh, Ryan Sigich. Is that the right yeah. name? I'm terrible with names, so I, I always – double check myself i ran into him at the big 12 tournament games i go walking by him and he looks at me like he might know who i am but he doesn't and i go you're in the wrong sport you know and i, I said that a couple times and like literally i ran into him like 20 times after that in the hallway so and i said i'll see you in about four weeks so it, he, he finally figured out that i had something to do with indoor soccer that's pretty funny he has some new rules to figure out that the the league put in place this summer and the, the last time i saw ryan sigich Kansas City Comets hosted the final series against Chihuahua, and he came on air a couple times to talk about video reviews. So I haven't seen him since that last series uh, in May. Yeah, he was all decked out in Big 12 official gear there. So uh, we will probably touch on those new rules if we get a chance here in the second segment, if you have time. We have some various different things to go talk about. Lot, I don't want to say lots of changes, but there will be changes with the team. There's always changes with the team. Should we get into the kind of breaking news stuff, or we should we say? Oh, that I a think bit? let's do that, but but maybe go up to about the ten thousand foot level. Last year's season started off really great, and then it didn't, and then it ended pretty great, and yep. they almost brought the championship back to Kansas City. A couple plays had gone differently in each game, and who knows, but. You take that roster and you look at, at this year's roster, this is going to be a faster team. I'm, I'm excited moving in, and I think that Comets fans should be excited too. I talked to Coach a couple weeks ago during one of the kick rounds, and he, he described it as going to be a even younger team, so they're still getting younger. And I talked to somebody else here just today, and they, they said it's going to be an even deeper team. That remains to be seen, and of course injuries will come into play and all those sort of things, but they're really excited about the roster that they're building, and of course we don't know all of it. Uh, let's see. we They've had several signings over the last few weeks of 
pretty much players coming back, resigning Ramon Palmer, uh, Lucas Sosa, uh, Junior Kazim's officially back on the roster and able to play. I don't want to say he was ever off the roster, but he wasn't able to play. Uh, let's see, Jacob Garza. Uh, see, uh, who else am I missing? Well, we can talk about some new players coming in too. So, uh, yes. in no particular order. Guerrero Pino signed this summer. Yep. He was doing this fly from Kansas City to San Diego thing to play with the Sockers. And so he comes back to Kansas City with the Comets, which is going to help in the back just because of players who are no longer here will get into. One thing I would mention about Pino is you might recall at the end of the regular season, Kansas City and San Diego – had a tough game here at Cable Dahmer Arena, and there was a little bit of bad blood left on the field. That's up to Coach Stokic to basically remind people you're all in the same team now. Yeah, it's. I don't think it'll be difficult. Pino's mm-hmm. a, a professional man, and even the one kick around I saw, he was he was already doing the coach from the the field kind of thing. Like he was uh, informing a young player, if you actually want to get playing time, you're going to have to do this better. Right, and then. Uh, Talking about changes in the back or near the back, free agent signing from the St. Louis ambush, Marcel Berry. Every time it felt like Kansas City played against St. Louis in recent years, Marcel Berry was somebody they couldn't keep up with. And I remember watching a game at the family arena in St. Charles where he drew, I think, two blue cards just because he would blow past Comets defenders. And so you bring his pace and his game being a, a different skill set than, than some of the, the Comets players, and so it's going to be interesting to see where he winds up in the lineup. Yeah, I, I, everything I've noticed from him is just speed. I mean, like, skill, obviously, but he, just speed. He was he was getting up and down the slightly smaller field here on the green turf at the KC mm-hmm. Soccer Dome. Man, you're going to have me doing that now. Um, but, yeah, it was just speed, man. It's, it's good to have some more speed on the team. Obviously, they were – that was one of their issues at points last year, and they they were getting faster, but they're getting even faster. That also helps because Coach Stokic, coming from the Vlatko Andonovsky school of thought about winning the transition game, having yep. a player with his pace, all of a sudden it gives you opportunities, and he can play in the back line, he can play in the midfield, he can play on special teams. Mm-hmm. I'll be curious to see if he fits in on the rap patrol and uh, see if they can be even more deadly on shorthanded opportunities this year. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, obviously it's a little early to be seeing that too much in training, but we, uh, yeah, I've seen a little bit of it. So, all right, we, uh, we've we covered all the announcements, right? I think so. Uh, and, and maybe a player here, one. a player yeah, there. Yeah, so I apologize. But uh, part of Pino coming in was – uh, Berto out. I mean, he he left. I don't want to say Berto out like we got rid of him, but no. But but he uh, is back in Empire. Yeah. Also worth noting that Tony De La Torre, whom the the Comets picked up in the the Combine draft last year, yeah. signed as a free agent with Empire. So a couple familiar faces when when Empire returns to Kansas City this season. That's too bad. I kind of liked him, but not that he got a ton of playing time. But he'll get more playing. He'll get more playing time there. I'm sure. Uh, so Pino was kind of a, a, a more or less like for like type of replacement defender, strong, knowledgeable, experienced. So that was kind of that trade. Uh, so anyway, kind of got info, official info that's not been announced yet. But uh, Ray Lee has retired, so he will not be back. And they will miss him both uh, defensively and offensively. Uh, his left foot shot from yeah. the yellow line was just, when he was on, what a weapon. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, a good, solid defender, and like you said, dangerous from you know what would have been a three-point line in the past. Uh, but let's see, new player in, not new player, old player, trade, however you want to say it, Lasia is back with Kansas City. Dare I mention about his adventure and journey? So uh, if you if you joined us late, you might recall a couple of seasons, or if you've joined us late, you might not recall a couple of seasons ago he was involved in one of the most massive trades in Kansas City yep. indoor soccer history. Kansas City sent Lucia Tetsane, Mike De Silva, and Richard Schmerman, Schmerman to Harrisburg for Zach Reggett. Reggett comes here to Kansas City, becomes a star overnight. Schmerman and De Silva wind up in St. Louis. Yep. Tetsane coming back. 
I think a lot of fans had gotten over that trade because you know how Comets fans are really passionate about their players. Yeah, they but, don't they don't want anybody to leave. But it, I, I felt like I spent all of last season defending that trade, and now I kind of feel like you you bring Ted Sane back, and it shows how great a trade that was. Yeah. Where uh, you might recall when Ted Sane got started here. Great skill, great pace, great shot in the midfield. And uh, you combine him with some of those first-year players coming back, like Leo Acosta, Mikey Lennis, and all of a sudden you start thinking, we have more goal scorers than just the guys up front, which now you add Junior Kazim to Zach Reggett and, and Rian Marquez. There's a lot of goal scoring power on this lineup. Yeah, it, it will be the who's uh, who's in form at that moment that can be played. And it's not just like, oh, we have to get a body out there because we're shorthanded. We don't have that position. Well, and you mentioned a couple names re-signing, Lucas Sosa and Ramon Palmer. Both came on strong at the end of last yep. season. And you look at the stats, particularly Lucas Sosa, it, things weren't going well the first half of the season. And then things started to click uh, following the West Coast uh, road trip last year, he came on strong. Ramon Palmer seemed to score goals whenever. And uh, I, I think you have a nucleus for a team that could go a long, long way in the playoffs this season. Yeah, and also of note, Ramon really came on strong after Nacho uh, became the captain. And Ramon stepped down from that by his own initiative, really, and he just really came on strong. So it was, you know, the, the, the stress of doing both apparently wasn't good for him, where it helped Nacho bloom, actually. So everybody's a little bit different. But Ramon, I will say over the previous couple of years, I'd kind of been like, well, maybe it's wrap, his, season, his year is wrapping up, right? You know, his career is wrapping up. But he came on so strong last year, I am not surprised that they re-signed him for this year. Yeah, I know. And, and I think it's, it's safe to say this is Nacho's I mean, – Stoke Kitchen's head coach, obviously, right? Yeah. But this is Nacho's team in terms of intensity, and I would expect to see how they ended last season for them to pick up pretty easily as, as we get ready to kick off 24-25. So, and again, I, I don't have official any status, but I've heard rumors of a, another good player coming in, or maybe two, to add to this roster still. And, of course, there was also the draft picks. Yeah, they. Uh, I always pay attention when when goalkeepers get drafted. Yep. So Especially first round. First round draft pick and goals. So one thing that the Comets demonstrated last year was some depth. And uh, you will see depth again this season in goal for the Comets. And uh, people on the inside will say that Philip Ejimado coming in last year made Neto a better goalkeeper. I think right now you have good competition, strong competition there, and an opportunity to look to the future uh, when you draft that, that way in the first round. Being the goalkeeper expert here, uh, it's Austin Rogers was the goalkeeper drafted in the first round by the Comets. Uh, From Portland, a great soccer city, by the way. Yep. Uh, the other two players are Ayer Ruiz and Luke, Luke Gaffigan. I don't know a lot about them. I, I admit I have not done a ton of research on them. I will learn more about them over the near coming weeks. But what can you tell me about Austin? Have you done any looking into him? Didn't get the chance to watch his uh, – just the way the combine – played out the last couple of years I was able to watch more of the games games they went midweek this year so yeah. I haven't seen game film of them but I did have a, a exchange with Matt Gordon after the uh, draft pick was announced he was out there with with coach Stokic in San Diego and he spoke highly of them yeah I would say uh, Neto is still would be clearly the number one going into camp but he's going to be pushed by Philip and perhaps by Austin a little we'll bit. We'll see. We'll see. It's, it's good to have options. And you, you talked about depth earlier and, and who's going to sign. We still have to see who makes the roster. And if you go to the Comets webpage and you look at roster, there's still some spaces left. Yep. So not just for returning players who haven't re-signed, but the potential for draftees and other free agents to, to make this roster. And you think about last year, Leo Acosta – Here's this guy that we sort of heard about, came from Chicago, and uh, Zach Reggett had recommended him. He was one of the best rookies in the league by far last yes. year. So I, I think we've come to a point where your scouting makes a difference, your network makes a difference, and if you can get the right pieces together, all of a sudden you can be a dominant team in this league. And um, you know, I know we'll talk in, in – the, the second segment about changes in the league, et cetera, yep. but there's good opportunities for Kansas City this year. The um, 
yeah, it, it's it's looking like a strong roster, and we'll I'm sure in about two weeks we'll probably break down what we think of the roster at that point when it's a little more solidified, hopefully, uh, and probably going into the the first game, which we'll get to here in the second segment. Uh, anything else about the players that we should bring up? I'm I'm trying to remember. Uh, I mean, the roster is looking pretty good. You mentioned uh, Leo Acosta. You know, it'll be the second year for Mikey Lennis. I mean, there's there's some talent there that are now mature players in this league. You know, they're still young, but they're they've had the time. I think two things I'm going to be looking for is the defensive pairings. So changes in the back. It's going to be interesting to see what Coach Stokic where he lands in in terms of does he have two set lines? Does he move some players around? DeBray Holloman got some time in yep. near near the end of the last season. So that's one thing I'm going to be looking for. And then in the midfield, you mentioned there are a lot of guys there that are going to be looking for time. And then the final thing I'm going to be looking at is Junior Kazim because last year the Comets basically had two forwards, two targets, so yep. Reggett and, and, and Marquez. You bring Junior Kazim back, and now you have to start thinking about how best to use him because when he did play, he's a guy in the box with a nose for the ball and nose for the goal. Yep. And so he'll get you those dirty goals in the box. That's just the way he plays. And so that's a kind of a good problem for Coach Stokic to have is where do I find time for all these players on my roster? So hopefully for Junior, he took all of last year to just become a more – you know, developed player because his first time here, I always felt like he was, if he was in the box, he was super dangerous. If he was outside the box, he wasn't so much. And, uh, but he, I saw him at the beginning of last year starting to put those pieces together. Now we got to see him do it this year into a real game because it's a, a lot of difference between practice and games. That, that's absolutely a fact. Uh, with a lot of credit to him, though, he showed up every day here at the soccer yep. dome. He put in the hours and he was just waiting for his time, for his, visa situation to be resolved it's now resolved and uh, you, you want to talk about a hungry player yeah uh, he's he's ready to go uh, he could come out breaking out early in the season too you know all right uh, let's let's wrap up the player talk for the moment unless we think of something later but uh, we'll take a short break for commercials and hopefully they'll pay us thousands of dollars which yeah <laughs> that would be nice we'll be back in just a second with a little league type type talk All right, we are back. Uh, let's see, league is a single table now, not two conferences, single table, 12 teams. 12 teams. And uh, it's just a, it's a little bit different. There's some rule changes. Uh, what what has stood out for you for like this the new formats for the league? Sure, so let's take a step back and, and review where we ended last season. Last season there were 13 teams, seven in the east, six in the West. You might recall the Monterey Flash ran the table in the regular yep. season. They got upset and knocked out by Milwaukee. They are not back. They took their ball and went home? Well, I'm just yeah, here's the issue, though. Because of visa challenges, it's not like all those players automatically have a home somewhere else, right. which you would see in other situations. And so Chihuahua did sign Alan Crespo. Empire did sign the Pink Panther, although there's – questions about Castillo's visa status and so we'll see if he gets playing time or not if he does Empire could be a very dangerous team but there are a lot of guys that want one of the best goalkeepers uh, actually two great goalkeepers there in, in uh, Monterey I'm not sure what's going to happen now and so we're now at 12 teams instead of two divisions everybody's thrown together it's not a balanced schedule so Comets nope. fans who keep saying why can't we play everybody the same amount of time it's not going to happen the one of the interesting things that you'll notice is last year there was only one game against Milwaukee that was the home opener at the beginning of the season yep. there are now multiple games in fact Kansas City has to go to Milwaukee first before Milwaukee comes to, to Kansas City I believe it's five games against St. Louis rather than six so Sorry, you, you, you lost one there, but but otherwise, there'll be good looks at, at teams. Chihuahua, a home uh, and away game, so a repeat or a rematch of last year's championship series. There's, there's going to be a lot to watch, and uh, Utica, uh, 
a relatively new rival for, for Kansas City, UCFC. We'll see them at Cable Dom Arena as well. Uh, a nice little ticket package for the Comets ambush thing, too. Five games for a set amount of dollars. You can go to all five games. That's exactly right. So, uh, do, by the way, it. do we get sponsorship for that? Now I'm promoting those ticket packages. You could try to do that. So Kansas City opens in St. Louis. St. Louis traditionally has a Black Friday game, so that'll be a 5 o'clock kickoff at the Family Arena. And Kansas City, after a year off, will get back for the New Year's Eve game at Family Arena, and that's a 2, 2 p.m. kickoff. So Comets fans early on have two road trips that they can uh, put on their calendars. Yeah, no, that's, that's cool. All right. Um, other than that, they do play, I believe, all but one team. So they do at least face everybody. Everybody but Texas, which is kind of odd. And so they get Dallas. They didn't have Dallas last year. They get an opportunity to play uh, back down there this year. And uh, I don't know. It looks like a more balanced schedule. We talked a lot last season about that horrendous road trip at the, at the middle of the season where they lost all their games, including the week where they had three games in Mexico. That's not going to be a repeat. So... There's a little bit more balance, but they have to end the season on the road. And so a lot. They, uh, the final two games in particular, that final weekend at Utica City, at Baltimore. And so it, it, you have to win your games, period. And it, it's, it's tough to end on the road that weekend. But there, there are other things on the road that look promising. They have uh, a February weekend in Harrisburg. A, a Saturday Sunday game, you would think that the Comets would be favored in both of them, and so it, it just is a different looking schedule than what we saw in twenty three twenty four. Yeah, it's uh, five of their last seven are on the road. Not that those are not winnable games, but it's just that there will be a lot of road games. Uh, they have to make their points early, like we've always talked about. You got to win the games that are there. You got to take your chances. All the, the good cliches. It's just a little more difficult when you got to go on the road for the end. So they got to be in a good position at the end. They don't want to go into those last seven games going, we need to climb a couple spots to make a playoffs. Well, and, and I'm going off memory here, but I think my memory was drilled in. Seven and one start last year, 0 oh and eight in the middle, and yep. then seven and one at the end. And so it, you're going to get peaks and valleys in the schedule. You're going to get some breaks from the scheduling and some difficult things from the scheduling is ultimately if you want to win a championship there are some games you're going to have to figure out how to win how do we win in chihuahua yep. they, they came close in the finals last year they were leading in that in that second game in the championship series tacoma at home tacoma seems to be the thorn in their side every time tacoma comes to kansas city uh it seems like they they relish playing here and then San Diego at the new Front Wave Arena, there's a, a midweek game in January where I would expect that the crowds will be better at Front Wave than they were at Pachanga Arena, and, and somehow the Comets will have to find a win in that environment like they did last year at, at Pachanga. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and again, kudos to San Diego for basically opening their own place. That's Absolutely. That's their place, so that's a, a good step for the league and the, the sport in general. Uh, not that the Comets need to open their own place. You know, they have a really good relationship with Independence Defense Center, but they're still not always the first priority. No, that's right. I mean, the, the schedule, probably a few more Sundays than Comets fans would like to see, but overall, Friday, Saturday, Sunday games, which is good. The, the league, though, if you look at what happened this summer, way more free agency than I would have expected players moving yeah. in and out around the league and so some rosters are going to look noticeably different I would say St. Louis for sure and who did they get they get some guy Frank uh, they got both Taiyus they got Frank and Uzi Taiyu oh, and and uh, which got all the headlines but actually the the one that intrigued me is one of the uh traditional great soccer families in St. Louis the Hundelt family Dylan Hundelt came yeah. home so he he left Utica City came back to St. Louis where his dad Kevin played. Kevin also played for the Comets and so he's going to bring some leadership to that back line that's been sorely missing. Yeah. So yeah, St. Louis has at least on the roster looked like a better team yeah. although they lost Marcel Barry. Uh, you know, they still have the same coach. They still play in the same place. It's still, you know, near St. Louis, which is not a good thing. But other than that, they look like a stronger team. No, I think they'll be stronger UCFC obviously lost Taiyu, but they picked up Vinny Dantas. And yeah. so 
just a lot of shifts there. It's going to be interesting to see how it affects chemistry. Milwaukee kept the core of their team. They signed uh, Robert Williamson from Harrisburg, but just lost Alex Bradley to Empire. And so I think every team is going to have to retool just a bit. Kansas City's not the only team who right. uh, facing a, a turnover in their roster. And so ultimately, once the rosters are set, we'll have a, a, a fairly good idea of uh, how things could play out, not necessarily will play out. Right, yeah, because you have to play the games. You never know. But it does look like Empire and St. Louis have made some significant improvements to their roster, at least at this point. No, um, no I think so. And so, uh, although I haven't seen the playoff uh, structure yet in right. this this table, let's just assume for the sake of arguments the top eight teams make it. That could There could be a wild card play-in game, eight yeah. and nine. We'll see. But there's some teams that didn't, do a lot of work on their rosters and there are other teams that did and so i would expect uh, a little bit of change in 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 terms of teams moving up other teams may be digressing chihuahua's the team to beat though they've won the last two championships you'd be crazy to bet against them for the three beat and they probably have just gotten better with picking up monterey players or just other growth so uh, it's uh, they're a solid team and and no matter what Whoever would wind up playing them in a final series has to figure out how to win there. Which not a lot of teams are able to do. That is correct. All right. Uh, Jose, so we we know the schedule. We know we don't know what the playoff schedule will be. I think it will be deep enough the Comets should make the playoffs, but we'll have to obviously see how that goes. But there are some game time, game play rule changes. Yeah, we uh, we could talk, maybe highlight a couple of them. I think what a lot of fans picked up right away is the goalkeeper distribution rule. I think yep. there was a, a, a little bit of uh, mixed reaction this past season when uh, multiple goals got thrown in in Baltimore at a game near the, the end of the regular season. And yeah. so the, the rule has changed that – I interpret it in three different ways. On a goalkeeper distribution, you cannot throw it over three lines. That's actually not a new rule. That's right. just a change of a recent rule. And, and just for clarification, that's a goalkeeper distribution off of a some kind of stoppage, not from a live play. Right. So that's the second thing. On a live play, you can throw it three lines. But the third piece, you cannot score a goal from your hand. And so in a live play, a goalie makes a save, gets up, he can chuck it down the field as far as he wants, but it won't count if it goes straight into the goal. And so it changes the dynamics, you would say, for Baltimore and Chihuahua on those smaller fields. So not straight into the goal, meaning it can hit the turf or something and go in and not count So because it hasn't touched a player. It can't. That's, yeah, it has to touch another player to that's, count that's as a only goal. My, it's like an indirect free kick yeah. in the good old days. of. My, that's, that was my little uh, – you know, qualms about how they phrased it. I'm like, okay, can't go directly in. Well, what if it bounces off of something? Right. But no, it, I think the intent is no more of those small field right. uh, throw goals. Which I'm not really a fan of the small, small fields. But on the flip side of it, I, I kind of like the goalies being able to throw it in there. So Yeah, the, the other interesting, I, I guess you could call it goalkeeper-related rule, is, is the six attacker substitution rule. So there was a game or two at the end of last season where – a player, and it's definitely happened in Tacoma, is with the previous rule, your goalie could make the effort towards coming off the field, and then you could bring your six attacker off the far side of the bench. And yep. Tacoma used that successfully. And so that rule has changed now. The, the, the goalkeeper leaving the the field needs to get beyond the the dashed lines yep. near to the bench for, for the – just like a regular substitution would yeah. be. Which, yeah, that one. Uh, they definitely use that one because you could just take a step. I mean, you yeah. didn't even have to. You just had to take a step and continue that path, but you had to take a step. Right. And so, I mean, it was a huge advantage. Well, and I think the the other significant one is the the coach's challenge rule. And so, they the, get two. The, assuming one is successful, they get another one. And so, I think that that's a pretty good compromise. Uh, this rule has been. 
I don't want to say popular, but I think accepted yeah. when when video review was brought into MASL a few years ago. And so I think this is a good refinement in terms of if a coach sees something egregious, he had to, no matter whether it was first quarter or last quarter, most likely throw the flag. Now this doesn't penalize coaches the same way who, who dropped the flag in the first quarter of the first half. Yeah, that's I. I'm in favor of the video review as long as they get it right and they get it relatively quickly. I mean, I, so just get it right. The referees are in favor of video review. I'm I'm a little bit old school, but I accept that that's the world that we live in. People make mistakes, bad calls happen, but uh, this system does attempt at least to get those corrected. Yeah, that's that's a that's that's all progress. Um, I, you know, soccer around the world is doing. Uh, what else? What else? What else are we missing here? Um, what are we missing? Uh, we're waiting for league announcements on broadcast, yeah. TBD. I, I think, uh, and I can say this having done this firsthand, the opportunity at the end of last season to do games on CBS Sports Colazo was tremendous for the league. It uh, exposed the MASL to a broader soccer audience and uh, an opportunity to connect with the hosts at. at the uh, studio, an opportunity for fans to view it in a different way, and uh, and we'll see what the league comes up with. I, I will tell you that Nick Vassos and I are ready to go, and uh, we might be announcing soon a change to our uh, broadcast approach for 24-25. Stay tuned. That, I will be waiting for that. Uh, we talked about players, new, new players, some leaving in the first segment. Uh, there are some new coaches, additional staff, the – the the team is growing in I don't know professionalism uh, whatever phrase we want to use but it, the the staff is getting bigger they've added more uh, trainer type of stuff I, I you know without going into a ton of detail that I would probably say not correctly anyway so they're they're growing in that regard too trying to be uh, you know just a higher quality at level of team well and I know this for for old school indoor soccer fans who say oh they used to play 48 52 56 games it, it's a different era we're living in yeah. and so the ability to recuperate from injury uh, in some cases the difference between a team winning and a team losing and so I think the comments are are being prudent about this what can we do to give our team the best chance for success by what we invest in off the field yeah, and, and we all have a, a, a romantic rem memory of the old days of how some of these teams played and the number of games and all that. But do sometimes when you go back and look at the videos of the older games, it's a little slower pace. It's, you know, sometimes it's pretty physical, but not quite the same. I, I can guarantee you in those old NPSL day days when they were playing three games on the weekend, yeah. those, those Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening games were a grind because yep. your legs just can't perform the same way three nights in a row. Not, not going full out. And no, no way. All right. Uh, any last words? No, stay tuned. We'll be back all season with uh, our analysis, our take on what's happening in everything Kansas City Comets. Appreciate Comets supporters for following Blue Turf. This is season three, I believe. Oh, man. Sounds I'll, right. I'll have to check when I go back to uh, post the pod. Three. Yeah, so it's been fun to do it that. Thanks, as always, for the opportunity. And uh, I hope everybody's excited for this season. It almost was there, almost was there last season, yeah. and just a few plays made the difference. And, and I think this team, they saw what they could have done. They are eager to take that next step in May of 25. And I think this is something we'll probably, again, cover over the next couple of weeks, things like, uh, you know, it's it's a second year for a coach being in charge. What what has he learned? What has he done differently? You know, we we know he was a good youth soccer coach before he took this role. We know how good of a player he was, and he was assistant coach, and all these things. It's a little different being the head coach and kind of setting that that path. So we'll we'll probably talk a little bit about those sorts of things, because uh, I you know I think he's he's learned. I think he would he'll come up he'll, he'll sit over here in the spot you're at and tell me what he did wrong last year and what he's going to do differently this year, but probably not the you know the secret sauce type of stuff. But he'll he'll talk about that. Uh, and, you know, again, the new new assistant coaches and just all these things that will, will make a difference. Oh, I think that's right. I look forward to your uh, interviews with uh, not only Coach Stokic, but other players you might bring on. And uh, it, it's that time of season. The weather doesn't quite feel like 
the end of fall and uh, preview of winter, but pretty soon it'll get cold again, and those hot winter nights, they're coming back. And I, I look forward to what changes you guys do, what the league does, what, what the different broadcasting. But we at the KC Soccer Journal, uh, I'll probably try to announce this at a later point, but we have a new person joining us who has some indoor experience. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that for the moment because got to see how much involved he'll be able to be. But we'll, we'll see and, and we'll have. You're sharing more than I'm able or willing to share at this point, but just stay tuned. Yeah. And let's see one other thing. The uh, – Charlie Hustle thing just dropped while we were here. New new Comets gear, it, and they dropped it with the start of training camp. So uh, check out at Charlie Hustle's website or their their flagship store. Not only a traditional retro Comets T-shirt, but a KC Hart Comets themed uh, shirt that that just dropped this morning. Yep, Monday I've, morning. I've just I've seen a glimpse of it on the video while you were talking, so it looked pretty cool. Uh, I might have to talk wife into getting me one. I'd, I'd ever buy my own and I never wear team gear I mean you you always see I'm very very professional or I try to be but I do I, actually I see I do actually have a comet shirt on underneath my sweatshirt so that's awesome uh, anyway I appreciate the time Eric and I look forward to talking to you a lot this year and we'll, we'll, we'll disagree on some things but I always appreciate your insight your analysis and we are out